Can you hear me? Can you hear me? If you hear me, clap twice. If you hear me, clap three times. All right, I'm very happy to be here. It gets always complicated when it comes to introducing myself. As one of the first questions you will get in this diverse world is, what are you from? And I know this question that might be a very simple one for many. However, when it comes to my case, the response always comes with an awkward pause. And I know these type of questions, these very simple type of questions that often come right out out of a handbook of a polite conversation. As when you tell people where are you from, they try to relate to you by telling you about the last time they visited your country, state, or a city. Therefore, the question of where are you from help people locate each other. However, what is interesting is how we tend to put people in boxes, to size them up quickly, which become easier to relate to them. However, when it comes to my case, it is very difficult to be put in a box. It actually requires thinking outside of the box. And I'm not saying the following because I'm seeking for congratulations or sympathy, but because it's the reality that I experience. I still sometimes resent the question because it implies that I can only be one thing. The one thing, incidentally, I had no right in choosing, which is to be born and raised in a conflict, which is to exist, but not to be recognized by others. Why? Because I barely meet the invented human criteria of the definition of existing as people. Of existing as people. Therefore, it is very important to understand that this identity card that I hold today is still failing to locate me, neither to describe me. Think about it this way. When you enroll in a university, one of the first things you will receive is your university card. It enables you access. Dining hall, housing, library. It gets you in. It opens doors. It shows that you belong. And when you graduate, you'll get a piece of paper, a diploma that gives you status before you even have to say a word. Therefore, the question of where are you from, or when a militant soldier is asking me about my ID, Hawitak Hawitak, he's demanding a proof of my existence based on the superiority of our invented national identities. Despite the fact that we as humans are blessed with our equal opportunities to connect and share our humanity. Therefore, this card is still again failing to locate me, neither to describe me. Why? Because born and raised in a conflict seems to be indescribable. The instability, fear, humiliation you will feel on a daily basis. Imagine that your day is defined by the number of checkpoints you have to cross. Imagine you can't get married to the loved one because your ID's color is just different. Imagine women having to schedule their labor where when checkpoints are open. Imagine holding this ID card will make no difference between prison and freedom. Imagine holding this ID card, this colored invented forced ID card, will ask you to give up on your humanity on a daily basis. Therefore, and despite the fact that I stand here today as a person whose identity has not yet been defined by the world's perception of a state or a nation, I choose proudly to stand here as a human being, a human 
who's refusing to give up on his humanity in the most inhuman places. And if you allow me, let me please walk you through my journey of searching for humanity in the most inhuman circumstances. They say that the eyes are the windows of the soul. And during my research time in several conflict zones, I've met with officials, scholars, civil society leaders, youth, politicians, and even soldiers from different conflicted parties. And I've learned the one thing that was powerful enough to cut through the blindness of stereotyping, fear, hatred, and even politics, which is when it comes to asking them about the future of their children. The human price of children's suffering, the price of raising millions of children with lack of childhood, lack of education and opportunities, simply the lack of future. They also say that a picture worth a thousand words. The following picture represent Pan Punk. This picture was taken during the Vietnamese War in 1972. It shows her running down the road naked after being severely burned after a South Vietnamese attack. But the question is, why should an innocent child suffer from crimes he or she did not commit? The following picture was taken in Sudan in 1993 by Kevin Carter. This ionic image that was held by several international newspapers, it, the winning price image, the winning price image that forced hundreds of people to call the newspaper asking about the faith of the girl because it was unknown if she made it to the feeding center or not. It was reported that Kevin took the picture and left after being told not to touch children out of the fear of transmitting diseases. It was reported three months later that Kevin committed suicide. The following picture that took place in Gaza Strip in 2000 during the second day of the second Palestinian uprising. The one minute video that was taken by Talal Abu Rahma, a Palestinian cameraman, shows the father and the son. The father waving, the son crying after they being caught between the fire of the Israeli soldiers and the Palestinians. And seconds later, you just see the body of the son dropping alongside of his father's legs. But the question is, why should an innocent child suffer from pain he cannot understand or comprehend? The last picture represent the body of the three years old Syrian kid, Aliyan al-Kurdi. Aliyan al-Kurdi. This picture captured his body after being washed up on the resort beach of Turkey. This picture caused an outrage as it was shared with huge volumes on social network, creating debates about Syria, the war in Syria, the politics in Syria, despite the fact that the war in Syria was taking place since four years, where millions of Syrians were displaced and killed. Therefore, the collective question is, what do all these pictures have in common? All these powerful universal images became unforgettable because they represent an emotional trigger. An emotional trigger that succeeded in showing us the failure of ourselves in protecting children. 
the failure of ourselves of protecting our humanity, our future. It forces us to unleash our suppressed values of empathy and solidarity, which lead us to care more. But most importantly, to think with a conscious mind of the collective responsibility we have on this planet. In a 10 years major study that was co-published by UNICEF and UNESCO, stated that one third of the world are living under conflict. The majority of this population are children, which means that one billion child or one billion children are under the age of 18 living in these countries. 300 million of them are under the age of five years old. The study stated too, that 5,000 children are being displaced on daily basis somewhere in the world due to a conflict. Some of them succeeded in running away from violence with their family, but an increasing number lose track and find themselves in a very threatening situation. A lot of them get recruited to armed groups and others simply just have to volunteer. As a result of social rejection, family breakdown, and witnessing killings. Imagine one third of the world and one billion children living under armed conflict. How would they challenge our concept of a humanity currently and in the future? We must understand that our duty to respond, our failure in protecting our, the future of our children must open serious doors to understand conflicts and transform it into an opportunity to confront their problems that cause them suffering, to find solutions because we as adults as people in charge are responsible for giving these children a future worth having. However, responsible humanity is not about being blamed for the world's conflict and wars. It's about your duty to respond to what's happening in your life, which is a big difference. If you succeeded, and rescuing your kids and children in an earthquake, I'm sure you will feel and fare better. This is what responsibility is all about. Responding in a healthy manner to what happens in your life. Therefore, humanity is a status and responsible humanity is a choice to be made. Responsible humanity is a, is a decision that should be made by each one of us. During my time investigating world's responsibility towards conflict zones, which represented through the billions of dollars of international aid, humanitarian work, and capacity projects, it was easy to learn that the major of these projects fail to put an end to one single conflict. <laughs> one single conflict. Why? Because they come with the mentality of conflict management and peacekeeping rather than conflict resolution, which fails to address the root causes of the problems. Therefore, it's very important for the visionaries of international aid to understand the following about people living under a conflict. People born and raised in a conflict will be raised in a perceptional uh, siege. This perceptional cage will be perceived as a normal environment while it's not. Therefore, any element or interver intervention to change the settings of the conflict will be perceived as abnormal. 
Therefore, it's very difficult for millions of generations of people living under conflict like me to think positively about humanity or even to trust the purposes beyond international aid. Therefore, it's important to learn the following. International aid purposes should be to help people become independent rather than dependent on international assistance. It's important to understand that freedom and self-determination are the foundation of democracy and not the opposite. It's important to understand that ending occupations and recognition come before sustainable peace. And before anything comes education. Education is very important. Why? Because once a wise man told me that everything can be taken, everything can be occupied, except this. Education is the most powerful vehicle of social change and self-development. It's important to know what you're struggling for before you fight for it. It's important to understand humanity before you seek human rights. It's important to value recognition before you ask for it. Therefore, education is the most powerful tool that can create role models for societies who lack it. It's the most powerful tool to give people a moral life option which they lack it in the first place. Therefore, it's important that intervention and world's responsibility towards conflict to come with the option of creating a morale option life again for people who lack it. In the end, I still wake up every day searching for humanity in the most inhuman places. And when I'm so close to believe that I'm living in an endless cycle of hopeless hope, I get awakened by superhumans, like Mother Subhaya, a mother that lost her child to the conflict, but she decided to raise the bar for humanity and become superhuman by deciding to raise the seeds of flour in the weapons that killed her son. She's giving a powerful message by holding herself accountable for the rest of her children, her neighborhood, community, nation, and future state, maybe. Please, hold yourself accountable for your ideas, thoughts, opinions, and maybe in action. Become superhuman. And before I close, I would love to leave you with the one question. Why do you think the seeds of flour succeeded in growing in a place that considered to be inhuman? Thank you so much.